um, excited about everything that's going on this summer. There are so many exciting things happening. Uh, last week, we had a bunch of high school kids out at camp, uh, several from this church. They were out uh, for the week at Camp of the Good Shepherd. They had a great time. Got to see a few pictures online, and uh, they had a good time learning about Jesus. So um, it's great. Uh, it was a great opportunity for them. If you have your Bible, we invite you to turn to Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Luke 15, verses 1 through 10. We're continuing with our series, Lessons from the Lord, um, where we're looking at some of the parables of Jesus. We're looking at some of the parables that Jesus told and some of the things that he has, has taught us uh, through these parables, through these lessons. So we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. All of us, at one point or another in life, have lost something. Raise your hand. You've lost something, right? How many of you lose stuff all the time? I know so many people lose things all the time. Be it money, car keys, TV remotes, cell phones, your wallet. Some of those things become quite difficult. We lose things all the time. And the level of importance of the item that we lost actually increases the dread we have in our heart. It depends on what it is that we've lost. We can be really bummed out about that. For example, lost car keys, when you have 15 minutes to get to work, that's a bad deal. When you have to get to work and you don't know where the car keys are, you go, I have to leave five minutes ago and I have no car keys, and I'm not exactly sure where they are, and you're searching around, that's tough. That's stressful. Or maybe you're on vacation, and you have all your vacation money tucked away in a special spot, and you have some cash you got out for just for that occasion, and it disappears. You can't find it anywhere. That is a a stressful situation. That's a problem. That's something that's quite a challenge. Sometimes we lose our keys, and sometimes we lose our money. Or for another example, maybe your kids have gone to bed, and they have taken the TV remote and lost it. And now the TV is stuck on Barney or some other kid's show, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't undo it. It's just there, and it's just playing over and over again. That's a crisis. That's an issue. All of us have been there. I was there just this week. I had no idea this was going to happen. This sermon was long done before this took place. But Friday, I lost my wallet. I came to our VBS meeting, and I reached back. No wallet. I thought, well, I must have left it at home. That's surely where my wallet is. I went home. No wallet. Tore the house apart. No wallet. Tore the car apart twice. No wallet. Looked and looked and looked. I was bummed out because I was thinking of all the things that I have in my wallet, my driver's license, my insurance card, my credit card, my debit card. What am I going to do? I'm going to have to figure all this stuff out. I don't have time for this. And then we had our meeting on Saturday morning and Robert came and he found my wallet. So I rejoiced. I was happy that my wallet was found. It was a relief. When we find what we've lost, we rejoice. We're excited about it. It's something that we celebrate. Nothing quite compares to that sense of relief when the thing that we needed most has been relocated. We rejoice in that. And it, because it's been our single-minded focus for a while. 
Luke 15 is what we're looking at today, and it's often called the lost chapter in the Bible, not because it went anywhere or because it was misplaced, but because in it we find three parables that Jesus spoke about where they were looking for something that was lost. And today we're going to be looking at two of those parables, and those two particularly tie together. You kind of go one into the next. And from these parables, we can learn that God's desire is for the lost to be found. We can learn that God's desire is for the lost to be found. And there's some lessons that we can learn from all of this. And the first is found in verses 3 and 4, and also in verse 8. And the first thing we learn is that every lost person matters. Every lost person matters. Verses 3 and 4. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after that lost sheep until he finds it? Skip down with me to verse 8. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Every lost person matters. Before Jesus begins this parable, the Pharisees, they were muttering and complaining, which they often did. If you read through the New Testament, they had a lot to say, and it usually was complaining. They were usually upset about something. Something had got their ire up, and they were upset. This time, it was because Jesus was spending time with tax collectors and sinners. They were upset with the people that Jesus was associating himself with. They were upset that he was spending time with them, getting to know them, eating with them. The Pharisees, you see, they were bent on observing the law. And they were angry who was also at Jesus, who was also Jewish, would be spending time with those that were considered unholy, unrighteous, unclean. Why would you do that? Why would you not spend time with the people that had it figured out, the people that were observing the law, the people that were doing things the right way? Why would you be spending time with all this rabble over here? Why would you do that, Jesus? That makes no sense. We're doing the right thing, and you're spending time with these people. Why? It doesn't make sense to us. Jesus goes on to tell them this parable, or these two parables, to emphasize that every lost person matters to God. In verses 3 and 4, and also in verse 8, we can see that the shepherd had more sheep, and the woman had more coins, but each of them was valuable. Each of them was worth looking for. The shepherd set out and looked for that lost sheep. He had 99 other ones. It probably wasn't going to be a deal breaker for him if he lost one. It wasn't going to end his life. It wasn't going to wreck his finances probably. But it mattered to him because it was his. The woman had nine other coins, but it mattered to her. She went and looked for it and spent time trying to find it. It's easy to look at people in our lives and to write them off. We look at people and see who they are, how they've lived, what they've done, where they're currently at in their spiritual lives and say, you know what, I don't see an answer to this. I don't see a lot of hope here. And we just kind of say, well, you know, that was the choices they made. And we move on with life. Say, I don't know what else to do with it. And we walk away. People that have hardened their hearts to God or have struggled with addiction and have given in over and over and over again. And you say... I just don't see how this ends well. To the casual observer, to the unbeliever, this looks like a bad investment. Why would you invest your time in them? Why would you invest your time in these people? But God's view of people is entirely different. God doesn't look at people like that. God doesn't look at people like that. His view is that everybody is worthy of love and everybody is worthy of an investment in them. 2 Peter 3.9, if you have your Bible. 2 Peter 3.9. This is what Peter writes. He says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You see, God is patient with us. I would love for God to come back tomorrow or today or this afternoon and be here and come back to claim his own. But he's patient with us because he doesn't want anybody to be lost. There is nobody in God's economy that's a lost cause. There is nobody that's not worth investing in. 
We have to ask ourselves, are there people in our lives that we're willing to invest in long term? Even when it looks like it's impossible, even when it looks like the odds are stacked against the situation, are there people that we're willing to invest in? A coworker, a family member, a friend, that seems like they're avoiding God at every turn, that have hardened their hearts, that have thumbed their nose and said, you know what, I don't care about this Jesus that you serve. I don't care about this hope that you claim you have. Are we willing to invest in them anyway? But we're willing to invest in them because we love them and we care about them. Because, you see, every lost person matters to God. Everybody does. Every lost person is in need of salvation. And Jesus died for every last one of them because he cared about them, because he loves them. And we need to love them, too, because Jesus does. And Jesus cares about them. How many of you have had or know someone who had a doll, a toy, a blanket, or something like that that they drug everywhere as a child. Okay, you know, you had it, you knew somebody that had it, one of your kids. If you're a parent and your kid had one of these items, I'm sorry for you, because it's the worst. It's absolutely the worst. The reason it's the worst is because while the child who adores this item, they love it, they take it around, they drop it on the floor, they leave it in the shopping cart when they're at the store, they always have to have it, and you spend all your time not only watching your child, but also this item, because if the item gets lost, that's a problem. That's a crisis. You have to know where that thing is all the time. I remember one time a bonsai trip to Omaha after something was left in a store. I had to get there before it closed, because bedtime was going to get real ugly if I didn't. It was important. It was imperative. This was of the highest degree of importance. It had to get done. And I felt really good when I had the item back in my hand again. Life could move on and we would be okay once again. The funny thing about those items, though, is when you think about them, those things that people love, those things that your, the kids love and cherish, most of the time they're pieces of junk. They're really not worth a lot. Because they've drug them around so much, they're all beat up. If it's a blanket, it's all ratty, it's been patched. The dolls are all dirty and all nasty because they've eaten spaghetti while they're holding on to them. They've drug them out into the sandbox. This stuff, you look at it, and if you put it on eBay, nobody would buy it. Nobody would want it because it's all beat up and it has no value. But you know what? It does have value to somebody. It has value to the child that owns it. It has value to the one that cherishes it and has had it since they were little. It has value to the one that drags it around everywhere they go. It matters to them. It matters. It's important. And they would go to the ends of the earth to find that item because they love it, because it's theirs. You know what? God feels the same way about us. God feels the same way about each and every one of us. When he looks at the world, we see people and they're beat up broken, damaged, look irreparable at times. But you know what? Nobody is too lost or too broken or irreparable for God because he loves each and every one of us. And it's his desire for them to know him as Lord and Savior. That's what he wants. Nobody is too lost for God. So it's important that we remember every lost person matters. Every lost person matters. And we need to act like that. When we go out into the community, when we see people that don't know Jesus, we need to act like that. We need to act act like this is mission critical to us because every lost person matters. There's a second thing that we learn that ties in with this. Verse 8 of Luke chapter 15, verse 8. It says, if suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one, does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? In the parable, in this parable we look and we see that the woman dropped everything she had and looked diligently. She lit a lamp, she swept the house, and did a careful search until she found the lost coin. The shepherd, he left the sheep in the field to go find the one that was lost. He took the extra effort to make sure they could find what was lost and what was missing. Jesus is pointing out here that they went out of their way to do their best to find that which was lost. 
Are we willing to put forth the effort to help find those that are lost? Seeking the lost requires our best effort. It just does. Seeking our lost requires our best effort and it requires us to do our very best and put forth an investment to find lost people. People are worth knowing the saving grace of Jesus. Matthew 5.14. Matthew 5.14. Jesus says this. He says, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Jesus is saying that we need to shine our light. We need to show a lost and dying world who Jesus is to pour into people and to show them that they matter, that Jesus loves them, that Jesus cares about them. In Corinthians, Paul says, we're Christ's ambassadors. We're speaking on behalf of Christ. We're taking a message to a lost and dying world. This requires our best effort. We can't do this by halves. We can't be a Christian by halves. We can't be an ambassador for Christ, kind of. We can't kind of do it some of the time when we feel like it. Sometimes this requires and it comes at a bit of a cost to us. It may require us to invest a little less in a hobby that we love and a little more in people. It may require us to spend money to go on a mission trip or to invest in a missionary or to invest um, in a church project where we're trying to reach the lost people instead of something else. It requires putting forth our best effort. It requires when we meet people in the store, when we see people every day, it requires being kind to people that we don't want to be kind to. It requires us to show love to people and extra patience with people that are difficult for us to love. It requires our best. Not some of the time, not when we feel like it, not when we've had our coffee, not when we've slept really good the night before. It requires it all the time. It requires giving our best effort. Winning the loss to Jesus is a major commitment. It's not something that we can make a cursory attempt at. And it requires the pouring out of ourselves in to other people. And this process may take a long time. That's the thing with people, That's, especially Americans. We're really super impatient. I'm really super impatient. My family will tell you, I'm the worst. I'm super impatient because I want things to happen right now. I want things to happen when I want them to happen. If they don't, it annoys me. And so we look at people and when we invest in them and we tell them about Jesus and they don't automatically respond, we're like, well, I guess that's that. But you know what? Reaching the lost people don't work that way. It doesn't. It's called discipleship. We spend time pouring into their lives over and over and over and over again until that begins to take root and other people pour over and over and over into those people and it takes time sometimes it's months weeks years decades before people make that decision I, I think back on people that I've known and people that I've that I've tried to invest in and most of those people it's taken a long time and I can look back and see the cool things that have happened as a result, but it's taken forever. And it runs contrary to every fiber of my being because I want it to happen now. But some of the most beautiful things and some of the most dramatic changes happen over the course of years. And it's really neat to see God at work in that. All God's asked us to do is be faithful. He says, be faithful in this task. Keep doing this task. Do our best. It's easy to admire those that are good at something. Drawing, playing an instrument, writing, playing sports. We love seeing people that are good at stuff. I love to watch people. I'm a music guy, so I love to see people pick up a guitar and just do something amazing with it. Sing a beautiful song that they've written. Wow, that is amazing. I love that. And they make it look effortless, don't they? They make it look so easy. People that are good writers, they write something down, and I just go, how did that come out of your head? That's amazing. How did you do that? You know what? I can tell you how they do that, how they write, how they play. It isn't by magic. They spend a lot of time in it. When you're not with them, they're practicing the instrument. They've written down and crumpled up lots of pieces of paper. They've hit the delete button a lot of times in order to become good at this. They've invested in it because it mattered, because it was important to them. They poured into it. When we look at people that are really good at seeking the lost, 
We think, man, how do they do that? Those people were just on fire for God, and they do a really good job, and how, I wish I could do that. It's not magic. They've invested in it. They've invested their whole lives to it. And guess what? They've goofed up several times, and they're trying to, to invest in people's lives. They've said the wrong thing. They've done the wrong thing. They haven't, they haven't been there for somebody when they needed to be. They just keep working at it to try and be the best ambassador they can be, putting forth their best effort. So the question for us is how sold out are we to taking the message of Jesus to a lost and dying world? Are we willing to, to make this calling first in our lives? Are we willing to invest in this over and over again and practice and continue to do it so that we can reach other people? Are we willing to do that? There's a third final lesson that we can learn, and that is God rejoices when, lost, when the lost is found. God rejoices when the lost is found. Turn back with me to Luke 15, verses 5 and 7, and then on to verse 10. It says, when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. In the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. God rejoices when the lost is found. In the first parable, the shepherd takes the lost sheep and he puts it up on his shoulders. Have you seen those pictures before of Jesus with a, with a lamb on his shoulders? You've seen those pictures, that idea? Him being a shepherd. This is a tender love it's because he cares about people. He doesn't beat it and drive it back to the flock. He picks it up, cares for it because he loves it. It's the same way God loves each and every one of us. In both the first and second parables in the story, they call their friends and neighbors and rejoice over that which is found. And we read that and we just kind of pass through it, that they rejoice with what was found. That's weird. Isn't it? Who does that? When my wife loses her car keys and she's running late for work, she doesn't call everybody on the way and say, I found my keys, they were lost and they're found. I didn't call everybody when I lost my wallet and said, Woo, I found it. I told a few people because I thought it was funny that I was preaching about this today, and I thought, well, that's kind of ironic, isn't it? But normally, if I lose stuff, I don't go run around and tell everybody that what I lost was found and show them my excitement. I just move on with my life. But that's not the way it works with God. God loves us so much that the thought of finding just one who had went astray is cause for celebration. It's cause for rejoicing. It's something to get excited about. John 3, 16 and 17. It's one you've all heard before. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's the plan. That's what's important. God wants to save the world. He wants to save the lost. That's why we're here. That's why Jesus came. The joy that God expresses when a lost person finds Jesus should impress upon us the importance of the job. It should impress upon us that what we're doing matters because there's cause for celebration. It's such an important thing that we're doing, taking the gospel to all creation. As a church, it has to be our primary goal to equip people to go out and to take the gospel to the lost and dying world. Sometimes at church we get pretty comfortable we're pretty comfortable when people come here, they come to us, we're like, that's cool, somebody came. That is cool. But guess what? There's a whole bunch more people that are out there. We need to go to them. We need to go to where they are and to make a difference and to impact them in that way. There are a lot of people that will never find this building, but they find us. They find us out and interact with us on a regular basis. And it's up to us to show them what a Christian looks like, what Jesus looks like the person of Jesus Christ as he radiates through our lives. We need to take that to the world that needs to hear it. It's been exciting to look at all the bad systems we've had this year, but it's also a sobering reminder there's still more work to do. It's super exciting. We celebrate it, but we remember, man, there's so many more people that we need to reach. All of us have a list of people in our minds that need to know who Jesus is. 
that need their lives poured into as well. As Americans, we're really good at celebrating things, though. We just finished celebrating Independence Day, and I think the smoke has finally begun to clear from my block. It wasn't me. How wasn't me lighting fire? There are people down the street, though. They were pretty excited about Independence Day, let me tell you. And we like to celebrate championship football games we like to, or basketball games and teams. We celebrate graduations, weddings, holidays. Some people love to celebrate stuff. You know, there's some people that are, I drive by every, every time there's a holiday. Their houses, they're always decorated. And I envy that, those people that are able to do that. And they get excited about it. My Christmas lights look like Charlie Brown. That's the best I got. You know, one little pathetic strand. That's it. But some people are really good at celebrating these things. But these celebrations should all pale in comparison to those that happen when an individual makes a decision to follow Jesus. We should be doing our best to see these celebrations happen all the time. Every week. We should be seeing people come to know the Lord on a continual, regular basis. It should be something that should be commonplace with us. People coming to know the Lord. God's desire is for the lost to be found, and every person matters. And we must give seeking the lost our best effort when we go out. And we have to celebrate when a person makes a decision to follow Christ. We come to our time of invitation, and I don't know where you're at today with things. Maybe you're thinking about making Jesus Christ, accepting him as your Lord and Savior. We invite you to come. Maybe you've been challenged and felt God working on your heart lately to do something more and to to take the gospel out. We'd love to pray with you and encourage you in the process. We invite you to come as we stand and sing.